Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Mena Ramos, a family physician and co-founder of Global Ultrasound Institute, along with Dr. Kevin Bergman. We are so thrilled to host today's webinar, QA Done Right, Effective Approaches to POCUS Scan Review. And as educators, we know that scan review can be a real challenge for uh, faculty all around the world trying to implement POCUS. If this is your first webinar with us, welcome. At Gussie, we believe that to teach one is to impact many. And as a community of physicians and educators, our mission is to, to really transform healthcare by decreasing the barriers to POCUS adoption through education and training. And to do so requires a community and a culture, uh, an inclusive community and culture, uh, which is really the driving force behind um, these webinars. So we aim to learn from one another, uh, exchange best practices, um, exchange uh, institutional wisdom across health systems um, um, and across specialties. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Dr. Bergman. Thank you, Mena. Um, appreciate all that. And we're, we're really excited for this webinar and um, wanted just to take a moment to introduce our, our really excellent, excellent panelists. We've got an all-star group today and just really thankful for them for for agreeing to share their experiences and their pearls and pearls of wisdom and in the hopes that this is going to make you all more successful in building your POCUS programs and your QA programs. So um, our moderator and, and um, uh, today is Dr. Svetlana Zakarchenko. Uh, she's an ultrasound fellowship trained emergency physician. She's the current co-chair of the ASEP Emergency Ultrasound System Wide Ultrasound Section. She's led the ultrasound division of the Hackensack University Medical Center as director for many years. So welcome, welcome Svetlana and thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nicholas Lefevre is a family physician and a faculty at the University of Missouri Columbia School of Medicine. POCUS Fellowship trained and has directed three um, POCUS curricula at three different family medicine residencies. Um, he helped to write the AFP POCUS residency curriculum guidelines, teaches ultrasound locally and nationally through the AFP and SDFM. So welcome, Nick. And Dr. Ross Horowitz is an ultrasound fellowship trained pediatric emergency medicine physician and the director of the emergency critical care ultrasound at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital, Chicago. Uh, he's also an associate professor of pediatrics um, and uh, medical education as well, and the Director of Ultrasound Education at the Feinberg School of Medicine at North Northwestern. So welcome, Russ. And Dr. Sahara Ahmad will be joining us in a few minutes. Uh, she's a tenured Associate Professor of Medicine at the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook, um, as well as the Program Director of Critical Care Fellowship, Director of Ultrasound Education for the Department of Medicine, and Chair of Ultrasound Curriculum Task Force for the School of Medicine there at Stony Brook and has been involved in POCUS education locally and regionally, nationally for over a decade. So that's our that's our group. Um, we're really, really thankful um, that they've um, agreed to spend time with us and share their knowledge and wisdom. And we'll hand it right over to Svetlana. Take it away. One second, let me just share my screen fully here. And. And uh, while she's scaring, sharing her screen, just wanted to um, say that we'll be moderating the chat. So if you have questions or any thoughts or ideas you want to share with the group, please um, please put them in the chat and we'll um, bring them up to the panelists at a couple different points in the webinar. Thank you, Kevin. You hear me okay? Yeah. We are so excited to share this knowledge with you as educators. This is a true opportunity. I'll tell you that we're also excited because no one has ever shared their knowledge with us. We kind of learned all of this on our own. This is a presentation I've never given before myself. So I have to take my hat off to Gussie, to the leadership for being very proactive and kind of feeling and knowing what you as learners need. Um, so even in initially when we were preparing for this presentation on Zoom, we kind of exchanged with some views with each other on the QA. And we're very curious about what each one of us is going to present because I might get some tips from, from Nick on how to do it myself. So I, I really hope that you get a lot of tips from us today. And we know that you're all leaders and champions. My husband is family medicine himself. So I kind of by association understand what your challenges are. You might be learning POCUS yourself, currently, but very shortly, you might be that leader who has to give the feedback to the colleagues that are coming after you. So QA might be intimidating. 
our hope today is kind of to demystify it, to show you how simple it could be, especially if you are following a standard procedure to do it, how to do it quickly. And I want to kind of deliver to you that it might be fun, fun for me personally, because I get to see some cool pathology. So by volume of what I'm seeing out there, I get to see it much more than I would on my own. I also get to elevate someone's career. I get to elevate someone's skills and also kind of like showcase myself a little bit as well as just do good thing for patients overall. So today's plan is going to be each one of us as participants is going to share with you a case or two and we'll show you how we do it just in real time. I also wanted to say, a few words about why scan review or feedback or QA, however you call it, is important. So the high level goal for us is patient safety. Feedback to someone who is learning is not only feedback to them, but for a leader, it's also kind of an OSCE. So you evaluating where is this learner in their pathway? Are they ready for prime time? Are they competent? So attending a workshop, yes, is absolutely the first step. Learning focus with a proctor next to you is important, but the real, I guess, test, litmus test comes when you're alone, when you're with a patient, with their body habitus. And also that's kind of how you get to see the pathology. So this is why we do have a requirement for uploading your, your exams and having QA because that's kind of connected to patient safety. So at Gassi here, we kind of have a systematic approach to how we do QA. And I'll go over this with you, and then I'm going to go over a real case with you. So just follow us through and see if you could match it to what we were doing originally. But I would say that there's two goals. Primary goal is yes, to give the feedback to this learner and to tell them what they're missing. Are they right? Are they wrong? But the secondary goal is also to give an extra teaching. So evaluate where the level of this learner is and then elevate them further. If they're very, very proficient in POCUS, I promise you could always find something more to give them. So make it worth their time. So let's go through the three sections. So this is how we see this, how we see feedback. First, we want to give an overall feedback, then we were going to give them a more technical feedback and the teaching points in the end. From the start, we're going to take a look at this uh, learner's comments. I will tell you that as gussy learners, you're amazing at giving us feedback. You tell us, wow, this is something I'm seeing. Am I seeing something right? And I'll show that to you in real time as well. So if there is a clinic, if there is a uh, an inquiry from this learner, which I very often find. I wasn't sure if this was a pneumonia. That's the first thing you want to respond. That's kind of how you grab their interest. They had that question and you're absolutely going to address that. Then you're gonna go, you're, you're following with me, I hope through the bullet points here. So you're going to comment on their interpretation. Is it correct? And if it's incorrect, we should absolutely dive into why they're incorrect. You'll then discuss the pathology, if there's any pathology to discuss. And I'm a huge fan of picking out an image and kind of taking a deep dive into it. The number two right there is the scope of discussion. So in either in my head as a protocol or on paper, I have a scope of discussion for each application. So for example, for a gold, gold bladder, which I will present to you, it's gonna be, do we discuss the neck? Do we discuss the interior wall, wall, stones? And those are the basics. Did I hit all of those? So that's your overall feedback. Switching gears into technical feedback, this is where you kind of as a, as a presenter or as a QA person can also shine. This is what I can teach you. So we'll always start with quality. Did you place your pro uh, probe correctly? Could you do something different with it? I always discuss depth gain TGCs, time gain compensation, and try to use if possible terms, not just reposition or move you're essentially giving a language to this learner to use for their teaching further down. We know that all of you are going to be teaching later on. And even if you're not a teacher, you will probably be teaching a student or a nurse that you're working with. So using terms during your QA that will remind your learner that those terms exist might be very, very uh, beneficial for you. And it will also make you sound really ultrasoundy and techy. So things like slide, rotate, angle, fan, rock. So those are the terminology. Then this next, next bullet point, addressing the views submitted. So if you disagree with how many views they submitted in order for them to arrive to this diagnosis, that might be a nice place to say, listen, for us to really rule out 
um, the fact that there's no gallstones, you have to fan through the through the through the uh, through the gallbladder, and you haven't fanned for me. So minimal image criteria is another term that we could maybe talk about today if we have time for it. But what how what is the minimal amount of images or views for each application that you need to submit for me to give you credit? That's another option here. Um, and discussing artifact, I always find this kind of a fun thing to do. So ultrasound is very techy and knowing and not knowing artifacts could be a difference between calling something positive or negative or possibly missing something. So as an example for uh, posterior acoustic enhancement where your posterior end of your fluid filled organ is very hyperactive, it might obstruct your free fluid. So not knowing that posterior acoustic enhancement exists in every organ that is fluid filled might be detrimental to you actually calling it a false negative. So artifacts for each application, I usually list them in my head. So for gallbladder again, posterior acoustic enhancement, shadowing, edge artifact would be those, those, the, those parts of terminology that I would use. So at this point, you've assessed where you pay your where your learner is. You say, okay, this is a very advanced learner. I will give them such feedback on some on another teaching point. So teaching points, um, we could maybe even give a link or a video for this learner, but also I suggest that you use hypothetical things. So if this learner is advanced, I would say things like, well, use a color Doppler or use a spectral or, or other Doppler on something like this that you see next time. Or you could give them a kind of hypothetical presentations of things as well. If such and such was present, you would have done such and such. This is where I will end on kind of going over our, our systematic approach and see if we could apply exactly this. I'm gonna start sharing here, excuse me. And I'm gonna share with you a scan. You can all see that, correct? Oh, thank you. This is a real exam submitted by Mena. Thank you very much, Mena. So I'm going to kind of put my QA hat on and I'm gonna say I'm here in front of my TV, maybe at night at home, and I'm gonna look at this exam and I'm gonna give this learner some feedback. So the first thing I would do is I would look at Mena's comments. So Mana's comments right here at the bottom say that this is a 35 year old female with pain after meals for several months. All right, this is very basic. I'm kind of already thinking in my mind, there's no question here. So I might be approaching this a little bit different if there was a question, if she was not sure. And then I will look at every one of the thumbnails that's provided here. So I'll take a look at the image number one. I'll take a look at the image number two. I'll run them through. I'll take a look at this one. And lastly, a look at number four, okay? I want to get a bird's eye view at what I have been given here. The next thing I'll, say is, I'll see is what did Mena interpreted this as? So she said that there was presence of gallstones, there was presence of mercy sign. I won't be able to comment on that. That's only she who knows that. And we'll talk about the wall thickening and uh, pericolocystic fluid. You know what, then my bird's eye view actually didn't see if there was any, so I might just go back and see, oh, I think actually I see what she saw. I didn't see it originally. And I see that there's a common, bi common bile duct that's labeled as normal. But from my bird's eye view, I actually didn't see any measurements of my, my uh, CBD. So I kind of have already a preset mind here of how I'm going to go through this. I'm gonna pull up the same standardized approach that I that we just went through and let's see if we could form this. I'm not going to write it. So just imagine it's if I was writing this on my own. So number one is I'm gonna comment on, on this learner's inquiry. There's no inquiry. She only gave me basic clinical setup here. Thank you very much. There's nothing for me to say here. Then I'm going to comment if interpretation is correct or incorrect. So I'll start with something like, this is a fantastic uh, gallbladder. You identified stones very well here and you probably diagnosed cholecystitis, though I have no comment on that. This to me appears like cholecystitis. Not a straightforward exam because you could very much clearly see one of the stones, but not so much the other. So by saying this, I'm going to kind of indirectly ask, did she see a second stone? So I'm just gonna go back to the images here. And this is, this is a still in the beginning. This is the first video. So take a look at this video. At the fundus, right around here, you see a very clear stone, but can you see the other stone? It's right down here in the neck. 
So I'm going to take my time addressing this because she didn't say how many stones she saw. She didn't say whether or not there was this, this was cholecystitis. So in the concise way, I'm going to kind of deliver to her is that I certainly, I hope that you have seen the second stone because that's the only way to diagnose cholecystitis. This is on our bullet points is discussing pathologies present. So I'm going to kind of give her a sense that there is pathology here. And I hope you saw the second stone because the only way to really diagnose cholecystitis is if the stone is lodged in the neck. So that would be my discussion of pathology being present here. Um, I'm going to move on to picking out an image. Image that I'll pick out here is gonna be number four. There was a lot of information here that I could see that I can give extra. So number one, I'm gonna say, not image number four, you've increased your depth. And now you could clearly see that there is a stone in the neck. If I'm really feel, feeling really fancy, I could also say, well, if you only looked at this image, you would not have probably noticed the second stone. So see how with fanning of the of your probe, you could actually get a lot of information. So thank you for fanning, something along those lines. So Amanda, you have increased your depth here. Now we could clearly see the shadowing stone in the neck and that there's a thickening of the gallbladder wall. You've given us a caliper so you know what the number is, and which is at the top right there, 0.87. So I'll comment on the fact that this is a really good, good exam. I appreciate the fact that you've increased it. Hopefully it will make your learner increase the depth next time. Then I'm going to, ask to also ask them, uh, can you see in the posterior edge of your screen a squiggly line? And the squiggly line here is going to be our vertebral bodies. So if it didn't think about the fact that this was a vertebral body, this might be a piece of information that will apply to other applications in the abdomen. So bringing that in here, I think might be important to kind of expand in your discussion. And lastly, I would say, I, I kind of touched on it, but didn't really go into it. I would definitely say, thank you for uh, looking at the, for the common bile duct, but I do not see in any images it being labeled. So I do not know if it is normal. I kind of see it right here, right? Right there is probably the common bile duct, but Mena did not measure it. She did not indicate it. So I might just request them next time, please indicate where the CBD is, but better yet measure it. So that's my feedback overall here. I'm gonna move on to the teaching points. So I'll start from the top of, uh, of the standard approach. And for technical, it says quality, discuss pro placements, adjust adjustments. So this is where I would say your pro, pro placement was excellent. You, if you had a difficult time, you could flip your patient and rotate your probe in various directions, okay? I'll say that depth was optimal from the beginning, but even better when you increased your depths, because again, now you could see the shadowing of the stone. Okay, um, let's see my own notes here. Um, and at this point, I, I think you could then move on to what is the basic here. So the basic views for gallbladder will be definitely increased, including a fan of the video, because that's how you capture multiple stones, as well as, um, as well as commenting on your artifacts. So there's lots of artifacts to comment on here. So from, from image number two, there's a beautiful posterior acoustic enhancement that you can appreciate. That I will say happens in every fluid field structure. The shadowing from the stone is present, but there's also another shadowing present. There's an edge artifact. So every time you're moving your probe, there's also an edge that follows your gallbladder. So I'm letting them know that there's a variety of things that they're seeing here, and that's the technical piece of it. I find myself um, that this technical discussion of artifacts, because I know we're all gonna be teaching, is important because again, it makes you sound sophisticated, makes you sound like you know what you're talking about, and possibly prevents potential false negative spoke false positives. Lastly, I would say for the teaching points, you can then say this, this learner was very proficient in what they've identified. They saw all the positives. I'm not going to correct their findings here. And I would just think outside the box, what else can we talk about? So since CBD was an issue for this exam, I might say, I might say consider placing a color box on the area where you think CBD is and seeing if the portal triad lights up into colors and non-colors for CBD. CBD should not light up as a color because there's no flow through it. So that could be a teaching point. And perhaps I could attach a video or a lecture or a piece of a lecture that I have particularly indicating the CBD issue, okay? Also, since we don't have any measurements here, I might remind them that CBD measurement is such and such anything that's 
over 0.6 is a problem. And then you could talk about the age of over 60 and 70 and where it adds a millimeter to each de decade. Um, I would also maybe comment on here the fact that there's large stones here that next time consider measuring your stones because you're in the primary care setting and you might see this patient again. So you will know if you're looking at the same stone or a different stone or if there's more stones there. So considering measuring your stones as well as most likely your large stones will cause more cholecystitis than your small ones and your smaller stones will cause potentially more cholelithiasis or biliary colic. So this, this, this is where you have a choice on what you want to teach. Do you want to teach the ultrasound itself or do you want to put something as a clinical uh, point in there and teach them a clinical piece of information? So that's kind of my approach. I'll leave you with this. If you have any questions, let me know now or later. And then I will invite Nick here. Mena, anything on the chat that needs to be addressed or before we move on? All good. No, we're good. Thank you so much for that feedback, Dr. Setlana. <laughs> All right. So let's just uh, do this in, in real time. Uh, for another clip, and then we're going to move on to a couple other folks. And we're representing, obviously, multiple specialties here. We've got um, emergency medicine, and we've got pediatrics and uh, critical care. And I'm here for family medicine and our, our scope of practice in family medicine. You know, you've met one family uh, medicine physician, and you've met one family medicine physician. So we have a, a very wide uh, variety of things that we do. Um, I do a fair amount of obstetrics, and certainly all of us, even office-based folks, are going to see folks who come in with um, early pregnancy bleeding. And so this is a, a case uh, submitted by a um, struggling learner um, named Nicholas Lefevre, happens to be me, um, about a first trimester bleeder. And uh, we've got a few clips here we're going to look at, and we're going to look at the interpretation and just kind of um, share some feedback as we go here. So uh, first of all, you know, I'm going to, again, start like Svetlana started and just kind of get an overview of exactly what it is I'm looking at. So I'm going to start down here and say, OK, so Nicholas here says first trimester vaginal bleeding, seven weeks by last menstrual period, thinks that he sees some free fluid in the in the cup to sac. Ooh, bad. Um, two gestational sacs, question mark, and one viable IUP scene. Um, and here we've marked that we see an intrauterine gestational sac. Uh, didn't measure fetal pole, so put a question mark there, but we saw one. Um, yolk sac was present. Did think that we saw some free fluid and also did see that we saw some fetal cardiac activity. So coming back up here, I'm just going to glance at this and I'll zoom a little bit so that folks can see. Um, starting along the right side here, obviously we've got an, an OV transducer and we've got a C60. So a curvilinear probe and we can tell kind of looking at the top of the screen that this is a big curvilinear footprint. Um, and not a, a transvaginal study, which has that really narrow U-shaped. So um, this is a study that we attempted to do just transabdominally and not transvaginally. Um, moving across to the clips, um, we'll see that we're kind of fanning through in a couple of different directions here. Fanning through here, all the way through the uterus. Fanning through here, all the way through the uterus. So when I'm glancing at this, uh, I've already got kind of an idea of what I'm of what I'm looking at and what the learner thought they were they were looking at as well. If we start with some technical feedback, just starting with the basics, I like to um, you know keep it simple. I tell people what courses I want a, a t-shirt that says more gel, more gain, more pressure um, as the general approach to getting more optimal images. And also that I want whatever I'm looking at to be in the middle of the screen. And that means top to bottom, and that means left to right. And that's an easier than explaining focal zones and things like that. So obviously in this case, we've got um, a uterus here. And the uterus, you know, it's kind of off to the, the right of the screen to some, to some degree. It's not right down the middle. We've got some wasted space here up in the abdomen that we could be looking at. Um, and also the tail edge of the uterus is kind of in the middle of the screen. So if I'm trying to focus on what's going on here in the uterus. I could probably make this this a little bit more shallow. As far as gain goes, the brightness of the image, it looks like a, a, a pretty good um, brightness overall. The you know fluid should generally be black and the fluid looks black there. And obviously if you start to over gain or over brighten images, you'll start to see echoes and shadows within that black. And so the fact that I can see all my structures pretty well on that black still looks black tells me that this is probably a pretty good 
um, gained image. So my general feedback here for this learner would be, you know, probably um, get the uterus a little bit more in the middle of the screen, both left, right, left, right, and top to bottom. And you could decrease your depth a little bit so that I could actually focus in on the structure of interest here. Now, um, this is a case where um, we're going to have to kind of take into context what this learner is saying and whether or not it's going to um, impact our clinical decision making. So there's a couple things. Um, we we thought we saw um, a fetal pole, we thought we saw a yolk sac, and we thought we saw a gestational sac. So I can confirm, yes, there's a gestational sac here inside the uterus. Um, as we're scanning through here, we do start to see right there a fetal pole sitting and also that little cheerio which looks like a yolk sac. So it can say, yes, this you've seen a fetal pole, you've seen a yolk sac, this is a definitive intrauterine pregnancy. So that's all good. Now, there were some other things they thought, they thought that they saw. They thought we saw some free fluid and we thought we saw maybe two gestational sacs and we're calling this IUP viable, all of which are pretty important kind of clinical decisions that you're making based on this image. Um, looking at this, I can see, um, you know, from a little bit more ultrasound experience that the black here on the right side of the screen, which we saw pretty well in our first clip, I think. Oh no, this clip, third clip. I'm not sure what we're calling free fluid here, but certainly that is a um, contained fluid collection here that is, you know, inferior to the uterus. So that's bladder. Um, and then if I look at this one, there's also kind of a black stripe coming in posteriorly here that I, I guess could be confused for free fluid, but is actually vaginal canal. So that's kind of a uh, a false positive or an overcall for free, for free fluid in that case. And that's some feedback to the learner that, hey, there was no free fluid here. You were looking at bladder. Free fluid's going to you know take the shape of the container that it's in. And that's a very contained um, collection in the area of the bladder. And the other thing that is fluid here um, is a common thing to see in first trimester bleeding, which is subchorionic hemorrhage. And when it's a really big subchorionic hemorrhage, that can sometimes be a fake out for people, um, both for free fluid um, and also potentially for a, a second gestational sac. And I can see, you know, in this image, I can see how um, as we fan all the way through here, particularly on this image, I think it looks like, let's uh, freeze this right there. It almost looks like that could be a, a dividing membrane, right? for um, two gestational sacs or kind of looking for another fetal pole on, on one side of here for, you know, kind of what um, mono die twins could look like, for example. But that's why multiple views are important. And as we do this, we can tell that, oh no, that's there's heterogeneous stuff behind this. That's not plain black. Um, and it follows the circumference of the gestational sac. So that's a, a common fake out in subchorionic hemorrhage. The other thing that they said in this case was that this was a viable IUP. And I know for sure it's an IUP, right? Because they they clearly showed me the yolk sac and they clearly showed me the gestational sac and they clearly showed me a fetal pole, but they never really focused on that fetal pole. And it's, uh, I'd have to, you know, freeze it even to appreciate fetal pole. Let's see if I can freeze, right? Back up, oops, not gonna let me while I'm zoomed in. I'll have to freeze it at the right time here, right there. So that's our, our posterior fetal pole there. But uh, they did not zoom in on that fetal pole. They did not measure the fetal heart rate with M mode. Um, and they also did not zoom in and do a clip clearly showing me fetal cardiac activity. So the first time that I can say, hey, that's, that's a viable IUP is when I can visualize that cardiac activity. And maybe they did, but they didn't show me a clip uh, that kind of proved that in hindsight. So. Certainly um, feedback for this learner and teaching points, you know, I'd say, you know, free fluid here is a fake out and it's actually subchorionic hemorrhage. Um, need to show fetal heart rate clearly to call it a viable IUP, right? So, you know, was there something major missed here? Um, if this wasn't a viable IUP and they said it was, that could be uh, fairly major for that patient. Um, it's, you know, they didn't call it an intrauterine pregnancy when it was actually an, an ectopic pregnancy or something. Um, but uh, so that's, you know, the main and main thing that, that we're worried about is that this is clearly an IUP in first trimester vaginal bleeding. Um, but there were certainly some, uh, some technical feedback that we could provide um, on depth and potentially on gain and on zooming in on some important structures that are small, like tiny little crown rumps. Um, and some teaching points about being faked out by 
subchorionic hemorrhage um, and, and free fluid, um, as well as what, uh, what that stuff looks like compared to a separate gestational sac. So all that's kind of um, some common kind of first trimester vaginal bleeding feedback. And we're talking through this. I put in the chat that there's um, not really one right way to do this. Um, it's nice to talk through it and you can do this as a group. I, you know, I, the ER docs where I uh, was working in Texas had a, a morning dedicated every single week where they got together with the folks on ultrasound rotation. They looked at every study and they talked about them together. Um, and, and that was awesome. And the ER docs at my current institution wish that they could have something like that, but don't have the, the time uh, given to them to do it that way. Um, one of the folks who provided me QA feedback when I was learning uh, for at least really illustrative cases would uh, use some kind of screencast software like ScreenFlow and make me a short little video and email it to me. Um, that was like, hey, I know you thought that was the X, but look at this clip and just kind of virtual teaching that way. And that was really, really helpful when he did that. Um, what we're showing here through Gussie is just kind of an example of a middleware, which is some place that the images go to live where you can provide QA that's not uh, in the medical record and is not, you know, living permanently in an image storage system like PAX. Um, and, you know, that makes it easy if you have access to a, a middleware software, and there are many, um, but many of them will, will kind of give you a template that you can fill out that will then kind of trigger stuff for your learners. So kind of what we're showing you today, but not everybody certainly has access to that. And just talking it out with people, I think, is also really helpful for teaching. So, um, Russ, on to you. Well, great, Nicholas. That was just fantastic. I love hearing about how other people uh, process the information and deliver feedback. So building upon that, I will share uh, my screen here. So I think about um, when I do review as having a conversation with the learner. And for anybody who has children, I think uh, you have sort of the sense that you don't have to teach them every single thing at every single interaction. Right, we sort of hope over the span of time that people learn information and you don't have to say to them, here are all the things you did right and here are all the things that you did wrong uh, for every single individual interaction. So hopefully we have the opportunity to work with the same learners over time and we can start to get a sense about what they're like. So uh, as we receive this information, then I take a look at the case and my first approach is, to acknowledge the uh, acquisition of information from the learner. Great use of POCUS is my sort of standard first introductory line. And then I think about the indication. So is this the right test? And is this the right question that you're asking? Are there other questions that you should ask? So let me look down here. This person didn't provide us information, but let's assume that the clinical information provided was something like five-year-old with chest pain and shortness of breath. So my approach would be great use of POCUS to evaluate someone, I presume, or I would imagine that one of your questions is, does this person have pneumonia? Other things to think about would be, if the person was a different age or a different condition, consider investigating cardiac as well as a reason why someone has shortness of breath. So uh, I'm often very careful to sort of uh, recognize that there might be reasons why someone didn't do something. So if I step automatically into the mindset and say, you should definitely do this or definitely do this, I can't really have a respect for the clinical circumstances. Perhaps they were limited in their time for interaction or by body habitus or other things that sort of got in their way. And I've gotten into trouble when I say you definitely should, or this was a mistake. And then they bring back some real important clinical information that limited their assessment or limited their ability to uh, evaluate a patient. And that's my way of really respecting the, the person who's giving us, me the information. My brief overview as I go through this lung case is to take a look at the images that they provide so I can get an overall sense of what kind of information they acquired and what they're presenting to me. And sometimes what I will see is that some information changes over the span of their evaluation. At first in clip number four, we see a very deep depth. And then as I go through the images, depth has changed. So I could at one point say under technical features, change your depth, but 
it became clear as I looked through this that over time, the person recognized some of the errors in their ways and made their own adjustments. And often I'll comment in the positive and say, great adjustment in your depth over time. And then that acknowledges what they have as opposed to harping on a negative, but really reinforcing the positive. My next step is really to look at diagnosis. Did they make an incorrect assessment or a correct assessment overall? And that's really getting to the guts of why we do point of care. Did they get the information that they really needed? Uh, and I often think that perfect shouldn't really be the enemy of good. You can make the correct interpretation of information, even if there's some technical features. If we highlight technical features first, then sometimes the people get a little bit disappointed and it's kind of bad for morale. So here I look back through and I'll say, are there A lines present? Yes, B lines correctly sort of assess where they are. Remember that this is a collection of individual images that make up a study. So I might not necessarily see the particular finding on one clip, but I can capture their overall assessment over time. So I'm getting a pretty good sense that the person has made some adjustments over time based upon what they've seen. They made the correct assessment that we have a plural effusion and a consolidation as we go through. There's some other images included in this study as well. My next step is to go on to some technical features. We may uh, learn about the expertise level of the trainee over time, or this might be our first interaction. So I try to get a sense about, is this an advanced learner or a basic learner? And that's really going to help me determine how much information I provide to them. So for the basic learner, there's obviously a lot of things that we can provide to them. So in the case of this, this clip is real brief and it was really deep, but I also see that she made some adjustments over time. She made the correct diagnosis. So to give her 20 things that's gonna affect the image quality might just be a little overwhelming for her. And then I can simply reinforce some of the really great things that you did. And I try to remember that the person's receiving this. So as the person giving information, for us to provide details uh, sort of seems somewhat black and white, but some people get very invested in their image uh, acquisition and get really excited when I give them a really good evaluation and also get really disappointed if they made some technical errors. So I remind myself that I was a learner once and we've all had our first day one time. So giving them all that encouragement is really what's gonna allow them the freedom to continue to scan. Uh, in that particular case, if I have a basic learner, I won't harp on some small details and say things like your gain should be a little off uh, or you need to give one less click of depth. I might say, focus your image in the center of the screen and make the gain good for your eye. And that summarizes some details. In contrast, for an advanced learner, I might highlight the next level that they can go to. So in this particular case, uh, subsequent clips include things like plural effusion, and I can highlight other features by saying, if you want to give a better view of plural effusion, remember you can go into the flank. Label your images and uh, give a little bit more context as to kind of why you get the picture that you provide. So reminding myself about the interaction that goes forward, I like to encourage people to give me a little bit more information. Hey, next time, I'd love to hear more about uh, any challenges or any uh, things that you saw. And what I've seen over time is people start giving me details like, I know that this picture is really good, but I was trying to get something else, maybe a little bit more of the flank view. Can I do this? And we start having an ongoing interaction either within this singular study or for subsequent studies. And uh, over time, what I start to realize is that they're incorporating this feedback and say, oh, I, I remember last time I didn't do X. So that's why I did it this time. And we have to acknowledge their improvement over time and kind of the things that we're guiding them for. So that's my fourth thing, which is technical features. I think about depth and gain and where the image appears in the screen. And the last one I like to think about as fix the pick, which is kind of like teaching points. So in this lung case, we have a nice view, but the image that is really um, important, the one that I've highlighted here for you, is really showing the pleural fusion off on the right. 
So yes, it's present, but I like to use words that really encourage. So I'll th say things like next time, or I suggest or consider sliding down one rib space and centering this effusion to really highlight what it is. I recognize you've highlighted for me. It's always great for me to see a wonderful representation of this pleural effusion and that pathology. So it acknowledges what they've given and then starts to build. Uh, for people who are really advanced, we can suggest other things. Uh, the best example I have is for cardiac. Maybe we have a, a good cardiac view and I'll say, you're a really advanced learner. Next time, think about doing fractional shortening or EPSS or MAPSI or TAPSI because that's talking to their level as the higher learner. But of course, I wouldn't do this for the basics. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna reshare just to make sure that we keep this on the center of our screen here. Um, and so that's the fixed bit. Uh, to highlight some of the other things that uh, one of the other instructors provided was, I give them a little bit of an article or a little bit of a link to a clip or some learning exercises that really highlight the details. But I like to really focus that attention. So it's not, here's a 45 minute presentation on how to do lung. Because I think that probably doesn't direct the feedback and make it very specific. I will take that one presentation and cut down the slides or say to them, here's a wonderful presentation on this site. Focus your attention from time 1524 to 1625, because that's when they talk about highlighting your plural line. And then over time, we start to sort of build. And I know that they're going to look at it some of the time, but at least we sort of show them that these are the resources that are available to them. So that's my overall pick. And I think in summary, I'd like to highlight the idea of respect the learner, give them encouragement, recognize they're not going to get everything in your single interaction, and that this is a relationship that we are building with our learners. Uh, and as we start having this really nice relationship, we get this bi-directional interaction where they give me questions and then I give them both questions and answers. So thanks very much. Good luck in all your QA. I talk to myself a lot during them because I think it's kind of fun. And I'm, I am answering questions as we're going through and I start to learn the personality of some of my providers and I'm always like, oh, Jill, you're giving me way too much depth. What are you doing every single time? And then she'll respond almost as if she can hear me be like, oh, shoot, I forgot too much depth. I'll fix it next time. Sorry, Russ. Hey, everyone. I'm Sahar Ahmad. I have a medical background um, as well as medical ICU critical care. Um, uh, Russ, your comments are really spot on. I think completely applicable across all of our um, different specialties and um, um, the, all of the previous instructors that have spoken, listening to you, um, I uh, really feel all of your comments. So um, I'll build on them, um, if I might. I think that all of us in our different approaches um, are doing the same thing. We're using QA sessions, um, such as uh, this one here as an example, in order to help develop our our clinician technicians. Remember with point of care ultrasound, we have to develop the clinical side as well as the technical side because in point of care ultrasound, we are both. Um, so we have to remind our learners to develop both the clinician side as well as the technician side. Um, and some sessions you may be focused on um, one as for example, your teaching points may carry forward some more clinical learning. Um, and some QA sessions, you may want to focus for that individual learner on more technical aspects, develop the technician in them. So that's really what my approach is, is um, uh, consolidated around, especially because again, for um, medicine, many of you are family practice and internal medicine based outpatient practice. Oftentimes it's multiple organ systems that we are ultrasounding um, simultaneously. So uh, my my recommendation is to first always begin with the patient, um, with their clinical condition and the clinical context. Um, QA gives you the chance to start with clinical context and then build the technical aspects from there. 
So um, what I'll commonly do is I will uh, pull up an image study um, such as this one. And the first thing that I'll inquire about is, well, what was going on with the patient that we are approaching um, uh, the, in this case, the heart or approaching this set of images. Um, and then the learner uh, will comment on the clinical um, situation. So then our, so our QA assessment will be already targeted to that approach. Shown here is an, um, as you know, an apical four chamber view. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps the clinical condition is a patient who has um, um, concerns for hypotension, heart failure. Um, perhaps the patient has a pulmonary embolism um, and then concerns of hypotension due to that. So depending on the scenario, take for example, if the concern, if the clinical concern was hypotension due to left heart failure, then we might focus more on the left heart, its size, its functionality, um, and from the technical aspects, we might um, ask to, uh, I might give feedback to um, allow this image to be further, um, further oriented, better oriented to looking the, at the left side of the heart. On the other hand, if the clinical context was a pulmonary embolism patient, um, then we would focus more on the, the right heart. So let's take the latter as an example. I would point out that the apical four chamber view, I'd point out some, some classical aspects of the apical four chamber view where, whereby, the, uh, whereby the apex is meant to be in the center, but in the case of a pulmonary embolism right heart evaluation, we wish to bring um, forward um, closer to the center of the screen, the right heart as we did. Um, then we'll move on to additional images that are available pertaining to the right heart. And we can look at, this is great. This is, um, then the learner will, will indicate that they have performed um, additional views, including shown here is the subcostal viewpoint of the same heart. Um, uh, and you know, you know all of you are familiar with these images, so I won't go through the, the key teaching points, but you have some opportunities here to include teaching points. What would a right heart that is failing look like in each of those views. Carrying forward, we can then, um, for the advanced learner, remember Russ pointed out, uh, made a great comment, and that was tailor your QA session to the capabilities of that learner. And um, in addition, your teaching points to getting the learner to be get to the next level. So for a learner who is now ready to go to the next level, um, then I might point out that there are some additional advanced modalities that can be determined, including shown here is a um, assessments of, of the TAPSI, the tricuspid annual systolic plane excursion. So a you know one of the indicators of right heart function um, that would be classically evident and uh, useful imaging for a patient for whom we are assessing right heart function. Again, with left heart dysfunction, if that was the clinical concern, we wouldn't go down that pathway. Next, for the advanced learner, I would continue forward and, and suggest to them the next level of format of imaging. Um, as an example, applying color Doppler uh, as is done here. I would then, depending on their level of um, expertise and my expectations of that learner, remember I have to have, as the instructor in all of this, I have to have predetermined where I expect that learner to be so that I can bring them either to or to the next level. And um, so for the advancing learner, I would point out that the color box needs to be oriented in a certain location, has to be, I would talk about the gain aspect, the technical aspects of setting forth the color box so that it includes the valve under interrogation. And um, I would make comments on how to set the gain. As you can see, each one of these technical aspects does start to translate very quickly into teaching points. So um, my best, my best uh, recommendation for all of you that are setting forth becoming instructors in QA is to 
pre-designed for yourself how much of the technical and how much of the clinical that you want to get to in um, for each of these cases. And again, that has a lot to do with what your expectations are for your learners. Shown here is an attempt at an IVC. Um, um, and again, I would bring back the clinical context. So um, IVC ultrasound uh, interpretation and um, so there are some technical aspects to IVC ultrasound, including that um, uh, at least a segment of the heart should be visible, including the um, right atrium, so that between the two images, I would do a comparison. So the original image, image number one, as you can see at the bottom left of our, of our screen options, compared to image number two, which we're looking at now, I would... Um, um, and it's a good idea to do this, just sort of go back and forth between images so that the learner can really get it ingrained um, in their minds as to what exactly we're looking for. I would point out the inability in um, option number one to, to view the right atrium and an option, um, that's right, in a, uh, unsure whether I'm seeing the right atrium, unsure whether I'm seeing the associated IV, um, uh, hepatic vessels that are, uh, that are, uh, typically visible, whereas in option number two, thanks, Svetlana, um, where I can certainly identify where the right atrium um, is present. Uh, that way, I feel more confident as to what the vessel is that I'm looking at. Um, and my final comment about QA is think practically. There are some practical conditions that your learners are facing in the clinical world. I'll give an, a quick example. Um, a, a pitfall for IVC ultrasound is to end up mistakenly looking at the aorta and then mistaking it for IVC. And so come with a predetermined um, set of teaching points that relate to common pitfalls. That is actually low-hanging fruit that will accelerate the development of your learners. So I would take any IVC ultrasound um, QA period as an example and um, give the opportunity to, to ensure that learners know that they need to identify the aorta and the IVC in order to feel confident that the IVC is what we're looking at. Um, so, so those are my key comments. Again, just to summarize, um, I suggest to begin with a, a clinical context, go into some technical aspects, including probe selection, machine settings, and a few other um, uh, items such as that. Talk next about image optimization strategies, including depth, gain, angles, rotations, et cetera. Um, many of our uh, instructors before me have covered those aspects, then um, relay each of these things into teaching points and ensure that you're covering pitfalls because again, pitfalls are common and are an easy way to accelerate the uh, quality of your learners' um, studies. Thanks for listening. Thank you. I would just say uh, as a comment also, because some of the chat discussions have been um, very interesting as well. We all understand the struggles of having time, limited time. So the way we approach it today is probably more comprehensive or maybe sounds more comprehensive than in real time. Develop your technique, know what you're good at, use your own kind of knowledge base. If, artef if artifacts are not your thing, they are my thing, then don't worry about artifacts. Don't comment on them. Comment on, on what you know, your unique audience or your unique specialty as well is important and kind of stick with those. Have it in your arsenal, written or kind of a protocol in your head and just keep on reproducing them. You know you know how to concisely say something such and such and, um, and pass that knowledge and wisdom onto your learners. <clears throat> Men, anything else in the comments that might have been uh, interesting? Uh, we have maybe five more minutes or so to touch on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you you mentioned just the reality of QA. There was um, a great comment about time, and this is this takes time. Um, uh, even to do QA very much more focused and tailored to the learner still takes time. Um, and not everybody in every institution has protected time. So, what are um, I think a a great 
question would be, what are ways to advocate for protected time? How do you, um, you know, we talked about practicality in a real practical way. How do you approach this challenge of not having the time to, to do the QA? If I may start, I have in real time written up what my position was, how much I was paid, how much protected time I was given and passed it on to my colleagues that they presented then to their leadership. And I think we should all be more transparent when we have something that's been gifted to us that is <laughs> and share it between each other so that to elevate all of us to a certain level, this absolutely is a special skill. You should think of yourself as being very special, knowing this, taking a deeper dive. We know that you're all kind of trailblazers in doing this. And it is amazing that, that you do. So advocate for yourself using us, you know, to stand on our shoulders and let them know, them being the administration, that it is not unusual to get protected time as well as how special they are because most of your colleagues will not have that skill. And, and oh, ultimately, oh. if I can, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Sar. Um, a Please quick comment. Um, on occasion, administration is looking for um, opportunities to bill and create revenue as a way of offsetting your "quote unquote" protected time, so you can develop you know, you know pretty simple business plans. Also, where point of care ultrasound is billable, it's a separately re it's a separate uh, format of revenue um, that is in addition to not in lieu of your patient um, visit. Thanks for mentioning those points. Um, there's so many great pearls that you all have offered up today. I I um I wanted to also add to that uh, just that this is a this is a patient safety issue um, ultimately as Svetlana um, framed up in the beginning and and so I think most administrative people that I know are are definitely interested and concerned about that. There's a concern that there's a lot of people who are running around with with handheld or car based devices around the hospital and they're unsure if they're properly trained. And this is really the way that we protect patients um, and be sure that they are because you get visibility and give them direct feedback. And along those lines, I just wanted to uh, open up to the panelists how in, in your, this is such a key part of competency assessment. And I'm just wondering how you incorporate this um, as part of the competency assessment that you do for your learners and your shop. I think ultimately one of the big advantages to having some way to do this, and like I mentioned in the chat that there's a bunch of different ways you can do this, um, is that there's a limited number of ultrasound champions at any given place. And you're and there's a lot of learners who are excited about this and want to do it. And there's not enough of you to stand over their shoulders and help them scan in real time all the time. So this allows you to extend yourself further um, in the educational process. Um, because your learners may be scanning in lots of different places and lots of different cases, and um, not always with somebody standing over their shoulder that feels as good about it as you do. So um, investing a little time and effort into figuring out a system where you can do this, um, I think will we'll pay off educationally down the road. Wonderful. Any well, other final to, thoughts, Mena? Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to summarize because, you know, um, thank you so much to our awesome panelists um, representing uh, such a, a multi-specialty emergency medicine, family medicine, critical care, pediatrics. Um, uh, there, there are some common themes that um, were echoed throughout. And one, uh, when approaching QA is, one is you can't ignore, you can't forget to look at the big picture, and that includes the clinical. What is the clinical scenario? Is this an appropriate use of POCUS? Um, this is something that is unique to POCUS. Um, and, and of course, there's the, the technical aspect. And then the take-home teaching points. That's, an, I think, another unique aspect of POCUS where there's a relationship between the educator and the scan reviewer, um, a POCUS champion, who has the opportunity to connect with the learner, meet them where they are, be both um, encouraging while also expanding and teaching. Um, that is something you, I I don't, when I read a radiology um, red image, I, I, I don't get a, hey, Mena, 
great job on this uh <laughs> this can that we you know so this is an uh, these are all unique um unique uh, opportunities for us to develop um, better relationships, um, not just with our patients with POCUS, but also with our learners and create this culture of um, patient-centered care um, and patient safety and uh, growth as, as clinicians. So thank you so much, everyone, for being present. Um, we're at the top of the hour. Um, with this uh, webinar will, is has been recorded and will be available to you all. Uh, and we hope to see you at the next one. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate all of our panelists so much. Pre it's wonderful. This was great. Svetlana, Russ, Nick, and Sahar. Take care. We'll see hey, you at the next one. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Happy scanning. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you all.